uh, to come and admonish the fathers. And so if you're a father today, a father in the natural, or you've been responsible for the raising of children, and we do want to honor stepfathers as well, um, I want you to stand this morning. So just go ahead and stand up. Amen. And stay standing. Is that okay if they stay standing? And as they're doing that, if I could have Mia and Eli hand out, yes, you can do it, um, a gift to each one of these fathers. So, Martha, just go for it. I just want to take just a short time to just say thank you to you, for you are fathers, and you stand in a place of fathering. And I, you, I stand in a place of my, my dad has been gone to heaven sitting in my cloud of witnesses for the last 11 years and he's still fathering me I think in ways because of the legacy that he left and I admonish you to leave a legacy for those that you're raising many of you are already in the process of doing that you stand as a spiritual leaders of your home and I want to thank you for that I want to encourage you to continue and let me tell you when they turn 18, you don't get to quit fathering. You continue to father all of their life, all of their life, all of their life, and you leave a legacy for them. And I just want to speak that over you this morning, and I just thank you that you are walking there. I watch you walk there. I am an unofficial grandmother to most every child that's in the building, and I know how well they've been fathered. And I want to thank you for that. And I want to speak a blessing over you this morning in that. So let me pray for you. Father, I just thank you for these men. I thank you for how they have stood and how they have fathered. And I encourage them to continue to father and to leave legacy for their children. And I speak your blessing over them. That they are blessed coming in and they're blessed going out. They're blessed in the city and they're blessed in the field. Everything they put their hand to shall prosper and you cause the blessing upon them. They're the head and not the tail. They're above and not beneath any circumstance that comes their way because of their connection with you. And I give you the praise and the glory for it, Father. I call them blessed, blessed, blessed in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, amen. I enjoyed last Sunday. I felt like last Sunday was a strategic moment for all of us as we celebrated Pentecost together, as we celebrated our 11th anniversary as a church. Amen. And uh, God's doing some really powerful things. I think we're sensing that. And what we were just even sensing this morning. Amen. And I'm, I'm still processing what I felt the Lord doing. But it was powerful. Amen. And so I want to continue this morning. And uh, this, there are principles in this message that I've been trying to get to for several weeks, and the Lord just wouldn't quite give me the, the freedom to get there. And so some of these things I feel like it's time, and it's time that the Lord wants to declare it, and He's just even been giving me further declaration. But this morning I'm preaching about one of the aspects, and it's a very important aspect, of an apostolic culture. And we've been talking about the apostolic and what that means. That's a big buzzword right now in much of Christianity, but it has to do with God developing an, a, a culture, a kingdom culture, which isn't just with leadership, but it's with every person, and it begins to even affect our city and our region. And so this morning I want to address breaking the spirit of poverty and lack. Okay? Now everybody don't get nervous when you start talking about poverty because they'll think, oh Lord, he's going to take up an offering. No, we just did that. But poverty is a lot more than lacking in money, yeah. right? You can have a poverty mentality and a poverty sp spirit and live from a position of you have lack in your life for many things. Yeah. It's more than just money. It can be a lack of healing. It can be a lack of revelation. It can be a lack of freedom, okay? And so God's wanting to, to, to bring a, a great provision in every area and believe it or not that is a sign of the kingdom coming is abundance prosperity provision in every area okay 
Now, as you talk about these things, you, you know, the truth is held in tension. Everybody understands that, right? And, and even though the, the sign of the kingdom coming, we're going to look at some things that Jesus did, some things that are happening around the earth today where the kingdom's coming and there's great breakthrough coming. But even in the midst of that, Jesus said things like, the harvest is ripe, but the workers are few. I mean, even Jesus was overwhelmed at times with need. Right, because he looked around at the great need that was around him. He's out healing the sick. He's casting out demons. He's declaring the word. He's preaching. He's teaching. And yet he was like, this need is overwhelming me. I don't have enough. He basically said, I don't have enough help, mm -hmm. if you read the context of what he was saying. Because the laborers are few. So in the midst of, of the, uh, the kingdom coming and bringing provision, part of the provision is that people get equipped to do what God has called them to do and they step into their post and they do and they bring the kingdom, amen, because of the grace that is present to do that. So in the midst of that, there's this tension of, God, of Jesus saying, you know, the kingdom's coming, right? Because that was Jesus' whole message. The whole purpose of Jesus, we're like, well, he came to die on a cross and be resurrected. Yes, but the whole purpose of that was so that the kingdom could come to earth. And he's introducing the kingdom. That's right, man. What a, what a great sight to have your granddaughter gripped to your words, right? It's amazing. So, so there's a truth held, there's truth held in tension, okay? There's, there's the reality of what God is wanting to bring, even if we see lack in our present circumstances, okay? So get a hold of that as I'm preaching today because you're going to be like, well... You know, I don't know, I look at my life and I see this and this. That doesn't mean that what I'm saying is not true. It's just that there's a demand that we have to put on what God is wanting to do to see the reality of that come. Right? And, and there's another aspect too. You know, last week we talked about Pentecost, and if you didn't hear that message, you need to listen to it. Okay? And you need to get a hold of those principles because we're going into a new season. And any time, and you know, people are like, you know, you prophets and apostles, you're always talking about new seasons. But whenever you go into a new season, things change. And often provision and prosperity, there's a shift, right? And sometimes we have to receive provision in a new way, right? There's a greater breakthrough that God wants to bring because what happened to the children of Israel when they went into the promised land? The manna ceased, Right? Because they were getting manna every day. They were living in supernatural abundance. And they're, you know, but at the same time, anybody ever heard that old Keith Green song, You Want to Go Back to Egypt? Yeah. Yeah. Right? Even though there was the manna every day, it, and the manna came down from heaven every morning, right? Every night, they collected it in the morning. If they tried to keep it, it, it had worms and it stunk, you know. But as wonderful as that was, you know, the Keith Green song is like, we're tired of manna. We want to go back to Egypt. But manna bread, right? And all those things. You have to listen to that song. But so the manna ceases, which was a miraculous provision of God. Right? Even their clothes didn't wear out. They were taken care of. But then they went into the promised land and the manna ceased. Oh my gosh. And now God says, you're in a new season. You're going to have to receive provision in a new way. And you're going, to have to, you're going to have to go and you're going to have to plant vineyards and you're going to have to do this and you're going to have to do that. It's a new day of new provision. So when we go into a new season, we have to be aware that sometimes God is doing things in ways differently than he did, dealt with us in the past. His word is still true. There's biblical principles that are still true. But often it means we have to shift what we're doing. Amen. So the word for this moment is God is releasing something that is, wants to release an overcoming anointing that overcomes lack in our lives. Anybody have an area of lack in their life? Yeah, we, we can all say yes to that. And again, it's not just financially, right? Sometimes we have a lack. Uh, we need physical health. Sometimes we need emotional healing. Sometimes we need relationships to be repaired and restored. Sometimes we need things to happen with our kids and with our parents because, you know, God wants to release something that overcomes lack. Amen. 
And, you know, a lot of times we live in this poverty mindset that I'll never have enough. And that goes hand in hand with an orphan spirit. And an orphan spirit often is like, that says that I'm not valued. I read what the word says, right? My head says yes, but because of belief systems in my heart, I don't believe it's true, right? Or you fight for position, right? This is a big, big problem in the church, right? Church, you realize churches fight for position sometimes? Because many of us, including leadership, we have orphan mentalities. And we think, well, there's not enough for me, and so I'm going to fight. I'm going to have a better program than the church down the road so that more people will come. That's an orphan mentality. That's an orphan spirit. And, you know, that's one of those things that just can't be cast out. It has to be healed. Right? And you see examples of that in the natural, like when... When kids who, who have been orphaned and maybe, you know, they get adopted and maybe they've, you know, the last few years they've known lack. And even if they give them food, they'll, they'll take food and they'll hoard it. Because they're terrified that I'm going to know lack tomorrow. Yeah. Right? That's, that's what an orphan mentality does. And God wants to heal and he wants to bring healing. And so what if it comes down to is a lot of times some of us still aren't convinced that God loves us and cares for us. We can quote all the scriptures, but there's a disconnect in our heart, right? Now, we need to get a hold of Romans 8.32. I'm going to read that to you in the New Living Translation, okay? It says, and I'll give you a second, but it says, Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for all of us, won't he also give us everything else. I'm going to say that again. Since he did not spare even his own son, right, God paid the ultimate price. He gave his own son. And if he did that much, and he gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Amen. So, and again, we have to convince our hearts that this is true. Amen. Now, there's also a reality that sometimes when, you know, for us to walk in real prosperity, there has to be heart healing that comes. Again, famous scripture here, 3 John chapter 1, verse 2. Okay. This is a big word of faith. Everybody in word of faith quotes this sermon. And it's a good sermon, but the real root of it is, I believe, and I'll read it in just a minute, but it has to do with we prosper because our soul is prospering. Right? Let me read this to you. Um, Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. Wow. Yeah. Now, a lot of times we're not prospering in our lives because our soul isn't prospering. Do you know real prosperity starts in your soul, in your mind, your will, your emotions, the way that you think, right? You can even have generous actions but not have a generous heart, and it hinders and limits how you live. Anybody ever given begrudgingly to someone? I'm not just talking about the church. Sometimes we give begrudgingly to the church. Oh, I know I'm supposed to do this. Right? Any of you ever give begrudgingly to, I'll just use an example. It was graduation season and you're like, well, rats, I have to give graduation gifts to all these people. <laughs> it's Father's Day and I got to give my dad something and I don't even like him. <laughs> Y'all laugh, but some of you are there. <laughs> Jamie and I had this conversation about Jim just today. No. <laughs> <laughs> right? Is that, does that show, though, there's something of a heart issue where there's a disconnect between our actions and the motives of our heart? Who, what, what's one of the things that God loves when we're talking about the context? A cheerful giver, right? 
did you know Jesus was just as concerned about the attitude of the heart as he was the actions? What was it he said? Hey, said in the law that if you commit adultery, right? But then he said, I, he said, I say that even if you look on a woman with lust, you've committed adultery, right? Jesus was like, it's your heart that's even more important or just as important as your action. So for prosperity to really flow in our lives and for health to flow in our lives, we've got to have a prosperous soul. I don't remember the percentage, and that's not even really the point of my message, though it is a point, part of it, is that they connect, it's like 80% of illness and chronic illness has to do with heart issues, bitterness, and unforgiveness. Now, I'm not saying if you're sick or something or have a chronic uh, illness that, um, that you're in unforgiveness, right? But sometimes those things affect us. This is medical science. The research proves it, that our belief systems affect our health and our prosperity, right? And so God wants to touch some of those things in our lives. He wants to break the spirit of lack. He wants to break the spirit of poverty. And a big part of dealing with this is he wants to break a spirit of fear out of our lives. Okay, so I want to look at this, okay, for just a moment. But one of the things in Jesus' model prayer, the Lord's Prayer, we call it, right, is that um, he addresses lack, Jesus addressed lack and the fear that goes along with it. I mean, the Lord's Prayer is a great prayer. It really is so full, so rich, so deep, you could spend a lot of time talking about it. But this morning, I just want to zero in on where Jesus said to pray in Matthew 6, 11, give us this day our daily bread, okay? Give us this day our daily bread. Now, the interesting thing about this is when you study this in the Greek is there's no other time that the word for daily is found in the Greek language. This is the only time they find this particular word. And the word is actually epiosius, okay? And I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I tried to study and pronounce it. But this word doesn't appear anywhere else. And so when people started translating this in the early church, it presents a problem because they're like, we don't see this word anywhere else in the Greek language. And so what happened in modern times is they would go back to early translations and they would look at the way the early church translated this word and the way they understood it. Have you ever been a kid and you made up a word? Yeah. Snuffleupagus or woolly booger or I don't know. You, you make up a word that makes sense in your context, right? We, we're good about that in Oklahoma. Uh, we're fixing to do everything, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, but in this particular word, so modern theologians, they tried, they, they went back and they studied it because they're like, you know, well, some people have argued that it means just enough bread to stay alive, our daily bread, right? Because we want to be really pious, the Lord just wants us to have enough for today. Well, do any of you live that way? I hope not. Does anybody plan for the future here? We all should be. That's actually really wisdom, right? And it says um, some people thought that it, it was, should be translated the bread we need. Now, there's, there's some truth to that, okay? I, I drive a Toyota instead of a Lamborghini, for many reasons, right? That's the bread I need in my life, right? Um, some have say that this means the bread of only today. Some say it also means the bread of tomorrow. But if you go back, and here's one thing that theologians did, is they looked at an early Syrian translation. Now, hang with me here. I know I'm, I'm sounding really smart. I know. But 
the, the Syrian translation is actually extremely close to the Aramaic, which is a language that Jesus actually spoke. And he actually taught in Aramaic rather than Hebrew because that's what the majority of people taught in that day. And that, what they spoke, and even if they were Hebrews, they spoke in Aramaic. And when Jesus came teaching in Aramaic, it actually opened up the gospel to go to every nation. Right? Because as beautiful and wonderful as Hebrew is, right, it's limited to this amount of people in the earth. And so Jesus came and said, Our Father, which is Abba, which isn't a Hebrew word, that was radical because he said, I'm bringing the gospel to everyone and not just the Jews. Right? So they go back and they looked at the, at the Syriac translation to see what this daily bread means. And so it, the literal transra- translation is, Amen, bread given to us today. So now if you look at this in the Syrian, in the Syriac language, that word, which is close, closely related to amen and comes from the same root word, I love this. It means lasting, never-ending, never-ceasing, or perpetual. So if you translate that from the Syriac language, it actually means give us today the bread that doesn't run out. Who needs bread that doesn't run out? Now, bread can mean a lot of things. First of all, it's a gift from God. But how many ever worry? You know what one of the most basic human fears is, is that we won't have enough. Maybe our needs met today, but you're like, what happens if I lose my job? We've, some of us have been there. I've been there. It's a terrible thing. Or what happens if I get sick? Or what happens if one of my kids gets sick? Or what happens if the economy collapses? That is such a basic need in every culture, in every person. Even if you're the wealthiest person on the planet, you are still going to worry about not having enough. Right? Because we're bound by a fear of lack. And Jesus understood that. Right, Because Jesus lived in a culture where even they experienced lack. Right, We won't go into all that today, you know. But the thing is, he, he instructed us as his followers to pray, give us today the bread that doesn't run out. Right? Does that change your understanding of that tiny passage in the Lord's Prayer? So... God's not only concerned about our provision in every area, but He's concerned with breaking the fear of lack in our lives. Amen. Because He understands, and I believe today, one of the things that He has targeted your life in this moment, in this season, is I'm going to break lack and fear out of their lives. Because you see, even this affects our relationships. Because if we fear lack, sometimes we'll get in relationships that maybe we shouldn't be in because we think we have to have that to have prosperity. All the single ladies. All the single ladies, right? Sorry. (laughs) Right? All the... All the honeys making money. (laughs) Throw your hands up in the air. Right, it's terrible. Some of y'all are like, well, I've never heard that song. And some of you are like, that's my jam. Right? (laughs) There's a Father's Day treat for you right there. (laughs) So to pray for bread without ceasing is not just praying for provision. It's praying for deliverance from the fear that there will not be enough. Right? God's breaking fear today. Man, He's breaking fear. He's breaking fear of lack. I, I sense that in worship, that, it, that there's something 
And there's something of fear, not just in our lives, in a core belief system, but I felt it shaking in the region today. I felt the presence of God, the glory of God coming in such a way that, as I said it earlier, and I don't even know what I'm sensing completely, but there's something ancient that's opposed the kingdom that's shaking. It got dislodged today in worship. Right? Because you know why sometimes we don't pursue the kingdom? Because we're afraid. We're afraid that if we lived without a safety net, there's not going to be enough, and we're going to fail because we fear failure and we fear lack. And I watch a lot of people who won't wholeheartedly go after the things of God. Sometimes it's just selfishness, but sometimes it's because of fear. What will people think? What will happen if I run out of provision in going after this? Well, I'm all for planning, but I'm also, I just think sometimes we just got to go for it. Right? Heidi Baker, Heidi Baker says, I don't live with a plan B. But some of us, because of fear, in a fear of lack, will live in this thing of, well, I'm going to do this, and if it doesn't work out, I can always go back. We don't want to go back. We want to keep moving forward. And again, I'm not talking about living um, without common sense. Right. <laughs> yeah. I'm not talking about that, you know, because there's wisdom in savings and all those things. Hallelujah. Amen. So we, you know, we're living and God's breaking this fear, you know. And Jesus said in what, Matthew 6, 33, you know, if all these things will be added to you, but you put the kingdom first. Wow. Right? Don't worry about what you eat or what you wear because the kingdom comes first. And if we're pursuing the kingdom he gives us a promise of provision, right? Are we pursuing the kingdom, right? Because sometimes, again, sometimes there's a, there's a gap where we're like, God, I see this in your word, and I'm moving towards it, and I'm not there yet, but I'm closer than I was, right? Just like with healing. Sometimes you see healing in the word, and you're like, you know, I'm struggling with this physical condition. I see that it's real in your word. I'm still not completely healed, but I know it's true. I'm basing it on your word and not my experience, so I'm pursuing it. Right? So sometimes there's a disconnect, and then sometimes maybe, maybe there's not provision because maybe we're not pursuing the kingdom. Right? And again, not condemnation. It's just saying we need to search our hearts sometimes about these things. Now, another thing that's relevant when it says, um, give us this day our daily bread, you understand that the, the word is ours, not mine. Our daily bread, okay? Now, again, I'm not trying, I'm not going to take up an offering, y'all. Don't get nervous. We talk about provision and money, and, but this is more than money. It's covering the whole condition of our lives and that thing of fear and like, but I want to read an account um, from, and this is from a, a book that I just really love, Kenneth Bailey, Jesus Through Middle Eastern Eyes, and I had to read it for my hermeneutics class. And it's a great read. I know it's scary. It's like 400 pages long, but I recommend it if you get a chance to read it. But he, he gives a testimony. <laughs> Guys. <laughs> Here's a testimony from Mother Teresa. Who's heard of Mother Teresa? Yeah, we've heard of her, right? Very famous lady. And um, she wrote, I will never forget the night, and this is, she's writing about her life in Calcutta, in India. I will never forget the night an old gentleman came to our house and said that there was a family with eight children that had not eaten, and could we do something for them? So I took some rice and went there. The mother took the rice from my hands. Then she divided it into two and went out. I could see the faces of the children shining with hunger. When she came back, I asked her where she had gone, and she gave me a very simple answer. They are hungry also. And they were the family next door, and she knew that they were hungry. 
I was not surprised that she gave, but I was surprised that she knew. I had not the courage to ask her how long her family hadn't eaten, but I'm sure it must have been a long time. And yet she knew in her suffering, in her terrible bodily, bodily suffering, she knew that, the, that next door they were hungry also. Give us this day our daily bread. Because how many of us live in a place where we're not aware of the needs of the people around us? And because a lot of times because we fear lack, we fear releasing provision into being generous to those around us. Right? Right? It's our daily bread. The Jews understood, and I talked about this last week, that God's provision was a gift. Right? And it came from Him, and they would give those offerings at Pentecost because, Lord, I'm giving this in faith. Right? It's our daily bread. And again, again, there's truth held in tension. I'm not advocating that we take everything we have and give it away to someone else. We take care of us, ourselves and our families, right? But there are times that God may speak to us to be radically generous. I tell you what, when we start, you start living in radical generosity, Hallelujah. man, it breaks selfishness and poverty in your life. It'll start breaking that selfishness. If you're struggling with selfishness today, give. And not always just money. Give of yourself to someone else. If you're consumed with your problems and your issues, are you giving of yourself to someone else? Right? Again, we can get out of balance in those things. There's always a balance, right? I know some people that give so much to other people that their own families and their own life suffer. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'd say it's far more common that we're consumed with our own selfishness and not loving, giving, and serving one another. Hallelujah. God's breaking the fear of lack in our lives. Amen. Amen. There's a healing that He wants to release. He's giving us our daily bread. Amen. Now, Jesus moved in supernatural provision. Right? And it's interesting because not only that, but in, in like, for example, in, in Luke 9, and there are several passages, and we're not going to read it, but you can read it later. He would send out his apostles two by two, and he told them, don't take anything with you, and that the people that you're going to meet are going to look after you and care for you, right? And it's really interesting. He came back, and then he's like, hey, how was it? Did God meet your need? Now, if you read in Luke 9, it's really even more interesting because you know what happens immediately after this account? Is they go and they feed the multitude, Jesus has just sent them out in faith to see miraculous provision in what they're doing. They come back, the multitude, Jesus is preaching and teaching to the multitude. They don't have food. There's thousands of people there. And you know what Jesus says? Hey, guys, you go feed them. <gasps> what? Well, Jesus, isn't this your job? Well, he ends up doing it because they're like, we can't do this. But do you understand that Jesus was training them to move in miraculous abundance? Isn't that such a strange thing when Jesus is like, y'all do it? Because that wasn't like, he wasn't really testing them. I think he was expecting them to do it. Because he said, I'm training you to move in abundance. Right? Because... There was, they were, there was an apostolic call on all of these guys to begin to move in miracle provision. Amen. Miraculously. One of the stories that I really, really love about Heidi Baker, and I wanted to review this before I told it, but I've given away all the copies of my book that tells the story. So I'm not looking at anybody. But even Heidi's book is, do you know what the name of it is? Always enough. 
And early in Heidi's time, and many of you know that Heidi, and she's over Iris, and uh, you know they care for multitudes of orphans in Mozambique and around the world, but very early on when they were in Mozambique, and they had about 300 children that they were looking after, and the government took their building away. And it was a building that was abandoned and bombed out, and they cleaned it up, and they took care of it, and you know they started experiencing some persecution because, heaven forbid, we take care of the unwanted, right? But the devil gets upset when the kingdom starts coming, right? And so they lost their property, and so they didn't know what to do. They went back. uh, They had an apartment that Roland and Heidi and their two children lived in, and so they take 300 kids to their apartment. How would you like it if that was your neighbor? I mean, there were kids everywhere. Some of y'all think you got a lot of kids. You don't have 300. Brad and Ariel are like, we ain't got no kids compared to that, right? <laughs> the Huxes are like, well, that's, you know, <laughs> there's prosperity in the house, right? So, <laughs> so they're like, we don't know what to do with these kids, but we have to care for them. Well, their neighbor, who was, they were also missionaries, they brought them a pot of beans for the four people in their family. And they started serving it to the kids, and they served all 300 kids out of the pot of beans for a family of four. Is that miraculous, abundant provision? Right? Isn't that what Jesus did when he told his disciples when they were feeding the multitude? And he said, go and give them what you have. And they're like, we don't have anything. He goes, no, just take this that you have. It's in your hands, what you have, go and start. And I think that they probably experienced the miracle as they begin to move. I think in the beginning they were like, well, we got whatever. I think it changes in some of the accounts. Whether There's such an anointing for breakthrough right now. Man, the air is ripe with breakthrough if we'll get a hold of this. And they're like, we've got these seven loaves and these two fish, and I've got this little bit in my hand, and okay, Jesus, and oh, my gosh, it's multiplying. It's multiplying even as I'm moving. It's multiplying, right? It's multiplying as I'm moving out. I think that they even, let's do it again, right? (laughs) But I think there was a miracle in the going. There was a miracle in going forth and provision began to break out. And so, you know, Jesus is sending him and that's the mark. And it scares me to preach this. That's the mark, one of the marks of an apostolic culture. There is no lack. Amen. And, and there's a lack of lack. Hallelujah. And, um, you know, Jesus, he did miraculous things beside that. They needed to pay their taxes. Right. Martha says yes because I filed an extension and she's reminding me <laughs> that I need to finish that, Right. Uh, but, you know, it's Peter's like, Jesus, we've got to pay our taxes, you and I. Now, a side note, it's interesting, and I was reading some stuff from a guy named Ian Carroll, and um, he was talking about that the Bible records that it was just Jesus and Peter that had to pay their taxes, and in the culture of that time, you paid taxes when you were 20 and over, which he points out that the rest of the apostles may have all been under the age of 20. Right? So, yeah. <laughs> Is that interesting? You don't have to be 60 years old to be an apostle. That'll mess with some of us a little bit, right? So Jesus, he's like, we've got to pay our taxes, Peter, because, you know, they're due. And he said, just go out and fish. And he says, the first fish that you catch, check it out. Peter catches a fish. Don't know what kind it was. Don't know where it was. If I knew, I might go. And cuts it open, and there's a coin that they pay their taxes with. It's miraculous provision that they begin to move in. Amen. Now, they still had to do something. They still had to go fish. Right? They still had to put their hand to something because even in the going, even in the doing, even in the moving forward, there was miraculous provision. Sometimes we want God just to drop something out of the sky when he's saying, if you'll begin to move in what I've told you to do, you'll see the provision come. Amen. And it can be miraculous and unusual. Hallelujah. I know I I was just reading a testimony, and I I can't even remember it completely. And Charlie Shamp will be with us in August. But 
They were in meetings in Argentina, and there was a guy that came who was completely broke. And, um, you know, he just came in faith. And uh, when he got back, there was money in his bank account that they didn't know where it came from. A lot of money. There have been times in Japan where we experienced that, where there was money in our account that we were like, we don't know where we got this. Or times that we found money in our pockets, right? And we're like, we didn't remember. Oh, there's money in this drawer when we needed to pay our $2,000 bill for our car repair. We weren't know, didn't know how we were going to pay it, and by the time the guy got there to bring our car, we'd gotten the money from a random, from random several different places. You know, there was a breaking of something uh, that, that God was doing. He's breaking the power of lack in every area of our lives. Amen. Now, that, that lack of... That lack of lack, it, it's got to move from it's just not our individual lives to where it's moving to our culture yeah. and even into our community, our city, and our region, right? What's happening with Heidi Baker in Mozambique? The culture's changing. Now, they've been pummeled with some storms and some, uh, some tropical storms, and I can't remember the excitement. What's that called? Um, Cyclone, right? It's a cyclone in that part of the world, a hurricane in this part of the world, right? That's the difference. And, but they've been pummeled, but there's been a shift in the culture as they've begun to move in that. What happens in a place like Redding, California, where this strong apostolic culture, this kingdom of heaven culture, starts coming, and Bethel is the largest employer in the city, and they've even been giving offerings to keep police officers from getting fired. Right, Because suddenly they understand there's a level of prosperity that we're receiving. Now, if you, if you have a carnal mind, you're going to struggle with this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're going to struggle with it because you're going to be like, well, I can't give away what God's given me. No, you get a hold of heaven's resources. Yeah. Yeah. And Bethel that years, decades ago was called Poverty Flats. It's transitioning to a culture breakthrough, yeah. right? One of my dreams for this city, and there's a lot of money still in Ardmore. We heard two or three years ago, still 57 millionaires in Ar Ardmore, right? But, but what, and at one time, you know, one of the things I always heard growing up, they had more millionaires per capita than anywhere else in the United States. There, there's... there's tells me that there's a, um, there's a fountain of wealth for the kingdom that God has that he really wants to break open and that he wants to even begin to transition a region. What happens when places like Ardmore and Marietta and Ringling and Springer, some of those places, what happens when they start getting uh, touched by the kingdom, right? And there's provision and where, where things like, you know, there's great prosperity that starts coming forth, right? There's, there's healing, there's miracles, there's salvation. But one of the signs of revival is, is a shift in economies, right? That starts happening and that is a sign of the kingdom culture, amen. So, lack of lack must become a part of our culture, <laughs> right? It has to become a part of our culture because we have to move past the disconnect the, the, where, there's, where we have lack. Because think about the new Jerusalem, which I believe is the church, right? You read the new Jerusalem and it talks about a bride coming out of heaven. Who's the bride? That's us. It's not just, we're the heavenly city, you guys. It's us, right? We're, and, and the, the New Jerusalem, what was one of the things that marked it? Streets of what? So we read that, we're the New Jerusalem, we're supposed to have streets of gold, and we've got to move past that disconnect, right? That's a lot of provision, and it's not just financial things, right? 
But it's where there's no lack in every area. There's no lack in the miraculous. There's no lack in restored relationships. There's no lack of revelation, right? You know, and, and, and sometimes there is that disconnect. Even Wimber, John Wimber, who was, you guys have heard me talk about him before, they started pursuing healing. And he's like, God, um, there's these things that I'm seeing in Scripture and that I'm praying for. I'm not seeing it yet. What's wrong? And the Lord said, well, the problem's not with me. <laughs> now, as they pressed into that, and I know you guys, sometimes pressing is uncomfortable because it costs us something. And we can stay where we are. Or we can say, God, I'm, I'm pushing past my limitations. I'm pushing past that. I mean, sometimes it can be as simple as this morning as we were praying before the service at 10 o'clock. Oh, my gosh. There was so much glory being released. I felt like we could have just stopped the service right then because there was such breakthrough in our prayer. Right? There are moments when there's anointing being released and sometimes when, because we're out of our position mentally, emotionally, spiritually, we miss what God's giving out. Come on. Now, there's grace that still allows us to move into it, but don't miss your appointed time that brings you into a new cycle of blessing. Right? God's breaking the power of lack. There is a lack of lack that He's releasing to you today. There's a lack of lack that He's releasing into your household today. In every area, He wants to give you more than enough. He is El Shaddai. He is the all-sufficient one, the God of more than enough. Right? He's giving you the bread that never runs out. He's giving you provision that never runs out. He's giving you revelation that never runs out. He's giving you glory that never runs out. He's giving you abundance that never runs out. He's giving you breakthrough that never runs out. He's releasing it to you today. And then today, He's giving you our daily bread. Amen. We're going into a new season. Right. Wow. Now, is this, is he just pouring out abundance so that we can just say, oh, look how wonderful my life is. I'm going to take a cruise every month. <laughs> Driving Jamie crazy because I'm addicted to cruising now. <laughs> but the thing is, <laughs> The thing is, he, he usually pours those things out, first of all, because we've proven that we can steward what he gives. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And that we can stir the wealth, we can stir the anointing, we can stir the authority, we can stir the gifting, oh, right? He's pouring that out and he's giving that to us so that we can be a blessing, right? The Bible says that the wealth of nations is coming into His people. Now, I believe that speaks of the harvest. When you speak of the wealth of the nations, it's usually the people of the nations. But to think that we don't need provision for the harvest is ridiculous, right? What, what happens when wealth gets poured out? I mean, I saw someone and some in here have seen things like this happen. When you're in a prayer meeting and a gem falls out of thin air into someone's hands. Marcia, you saw that, didn't you? She was in a service. Tell us what happened. I'm, I'm wrapping up here, I promise you guys. I know there's five. I don't think you turned it on. Global fires, Woo, sorry, <laughs> global fire in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. I was in a service and we were worshiping and a little, a, a younger teenage boy just right next to me 
I, I, I kept seeing things like shiny falling, and he reached up and caught it, and, and he was showing us, and it was an actual gem. It was amazing. Now, that freaks some people out. <laughs> yeah, Jamie said, I'll make me a necklace, right? But if God will do something like that that just seems extravagant and foolish to some of us, isn't he big enough to pour out more than enough in all of our lives? So what do we do with this, right? What do we do with this? What, what, first of all, I think, you know, we need to meditate on the goodness of God, right? Because you know how your life starts changing? Because there are moments that God can touch us, and I believe he's pouring out breakthrough this morning. But what happens when we start daily... Because here's where we miss it sometimes. We get in a service and we get all excited. Woo! And then we walk away and we don't change the way we think or the way we live. When daily discipline, meditating on the goodness of God, it actually, when we do that consistently, it actually starts not only changing the way we think, but science says it starts changing our brain chemistry. Right? Because sometimes we're addicted to negative thinking and unbelief, and we start meditating on the goodness of God, it changes the way we think, and, and we start getting addicted to the goodness of God. Yeah. Meditate on those things. Take practical steps. Meditate on verses that talk about His faithfulness and provision. Read some stories from kingdom people that are bringing breakthrough. Heidi Baker, Bill Johnson, Randy Clark, there are many more. Some of those people that are seeing unbelievable things happen because they're bringing the kingdom to earth. And that provision is seeing miraculous things coming forth in people's lives. God bless Kenneth Copeland. So, hallelujah. Understand that we must shift our mindset that true prosperity isn't about how much we get, but how much we can give away. Amen. Right? We, we've sometimes got it backwards. It's about how much we can give. Right? How much we can give away. And then understand, and we'll touch on this more maybe in days ahead, if one of the keys to an apostolic culture is a lack of lack, that means that we need to make sure there's apostolic alignment in our lives. Because apostolic anointing produces certain things. Right? And so in my life, I want to make sure that I'm apostolically aligned. And in, some people say, well, I follow this apostle. and Well, if they don't know your name, they're probably not your apostle. That's the biggest bunch of foolishness I've ever heard. Just because you listen to a somebody on, your, on a podcast, they are not your apostle. Get saved and get in real relationship with a real body and real connection. Authority only works in community. Okay? And we've reacted to error and we've run from authority and that only produces more error. And that's all I'll say about that. There's breakthrough today. Lord, release heaven's culture in all of our lives. Give us this day our daily bread. Let's stand up together. Father, I thank you today that you're breaking the, the fear. First of all, you're breaking the fear of lack out of our lives. And you're releasing healing right now. There's healing Father, I thank you that you're realigning our belief systems to believe. Even if there are circumstances in our life right now that are contrary to this truth, God, you're realigning. Father, you're bringing us into the flow and the move of heaven's culture today. Father, individually, as families, as a body, even in this city, God, I just decree that there is a movement of heaven that we're moving with right now. We're moving in the rhythm of heaven. We're moving in the blessing of heaven. We're moving in the outpouring of heaven in our lives today. And so, Father, I thank you. Even, even this week, Lord, I declare that there's going to be breakthrough 
not just financially, it may be financially, but Father, there's going to be breakthrough in provision, healing, abundance, relationships restored. Father God, this week in Jesus' name, as the apostolic culture of heaven starts further getting released today, Father, that let there be a lack of lack in our lives. Father, let there be a lack of lack. Break fear, God, in Jesus' name. Father, reveal yourself as El Shaddai, the God who is more than enough, the all-sufficient one. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, Father, I just decree that today. Intercessors, stay on your post this week. There's things that the, that the Lord is dislodging. Get in your post. You're, you're a part of seeing that further continue this week. Amen. Stay on your post. It's important. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Amen. Are you guys receiving that? Isn't he good? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's breaking the power of poverty. He's healing the orphan spirit in our lives further in this season that we can go into the new things. We can take the land in Jesus' name. Amen. The manna may have ceased, but there's new provision for you. Amen. Praise God. All right. God's good. Happy Father's Day. Continue to pray um, for Gary Williamson's mom, Helen. And ha when it, has she got have surgery scheduled yet? Um, possibly tomorrow afternoon. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah, she needs some blood pressure things to happen further. Yeah. Sodium, Sodium to come up. So be praying for Helen. Be praying for Dwayne this morning. Um, Dwayne's blood pressure was really high, so pray for him as well. And um, I'm sure there are other needs that I may have forgotten about. And again, Global Family Nights this Wednesday. If you have questions about that, you can contact us or ask me. And you're, feel free to invite people to those. Amen. Uh, it, it, you can definitely invite people. We encourage that. Amen. So, praise God. Happy Father's Day. Have a great day. If you need um, prophetic word, prophetic ministry, team here. If you need prayer for physical healing, over here. God bless you. Have a great day and a great week. And we'll see you Wednesday and or Sunday. Amen. Bless you.